Great. Um, thank you all so much for giving me the chance to talk here. Um, as Meg said, I'm David Newbury. I'm the head of software at Getty. And so my, my job is really to manage the teams that build our software ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, Getty's been involved in IIIF for quite a while. And this is, we're beginning to, to play with interesting ways to use it and to move forward. And so we've built out, as Meg said, a couple of experiences um, that are using it. And, you know, I wanted to thank Meg and Josh and Glenn and the rest of the IIIF team for you know, giving me the opportunity to write that post for them. It was, it's really fun to be able to try to figure out how to take what we're doing and turn it into words and um, to be able to tell the story of this project that we've been working on. So to give you some backstory around why, what we are doing here, uh, one of the archives that Getty gets to be the custodian for is the Ed Ruscha Streets of LA archive. Um, Ed Ruscha is a, a reasonably well-known LA artist. <clears throat> and one of the projects that he's been doing over the past 40 years, 50 years at least, has been photographing the streets of Los Angeles. He would put a tr camera in the back of a pickup truck um, with a motorized reel using a bunch of old 35 millimeter film, black and white from the film industry and drive up and down the streets of Los Angeles taking photos of both sides of the street. Um, he started doing this in the 60s. Um, he continues to do it through today. He, um, the man with the camera is actually his brother. Um, Ed, I think Ed at the beginning was the guy who did the photography, but as the project went on, he outsourced some of the actual photography work. But it was really fun. He's taken, he takes meticulous notes talking through the entire process. Um, so it's incredibly consistent. Um, and one, it's been this amazing discovery of the archive and all the work that's gone in it. Um, one of the, he, we have about 500,000 negatives from this project. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've been working to get those digitized. In particular, we have, I believe it is 12 separate times that Ed drove up and down Sunset Boulevard, taking photos of both sides of the street. So for those of you who aren't in LA, um, this is Sunset Boulevard. It starts at the ocean and it goes all the way into downtown Los Angeles. <clears throat> It is longer than this, but the path that he took was about 24 miles long. Um, and so I, we actually have, I guess, 14 shoots of it. Um, and he shot both sides of the street, which is a, nearly 100,000 photos just of Sunset Boulevard. And the major way that anyone is aware of Ed Ruscha's project doing this was a book that he put out called Every Building on the Sunset Strip. It was this long accordion style book in which he took photos from this archive and stitched them together to show Sunset Boulevard. Uh, this is one of Ed Ruscha's small publications. It's one of the things he's well known for. Uh, but for almost everyone, this was the entire access to this enormous archival collection. And at Getty, um, this was the access that we gave to that collection. Um, if you're familiar with archives, this is our finding aid. Um, it is, it's a great finding aid as far as finding aids go, but it is not perhaps the most impressive or useful way to view a massive photographic archive. And we ran into, I mean, and this is what the archive looked like at that point. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of photos round on motion picture spools, climate controlled, they're negative so that all of the images are black and white, but they're also inverted. So almost nobody has ever seen these photos. Ed Ruscha hasn't seen the photos. I think the only person who saw them was whoever's job it was, was to develop them. And so <clears throat> Getty took on one of those projects where you go and you digitize huge numbers of photos. And this is the digitization rig we built for it. Um, you see the giant fume extractors, it turned the, as old, old film does, it was starting to get vinegar syndrome. And so 
That is to pull the toxic fumes out of it as it rolls through the reel. And it's the photos that come out of this are really, really fun to see. Uh, there are all of these amazing photos documenting the history of Los Angeles. This is the Cinerama Theater. <clears throat> um, this is Filthy McNasty's Bar. Uh, this was originally the Melody Lounge, which is where Bugsy Siegel and Mickey Cohn uh, ran gambling back, way back in the day. Um, it was a rock club. I think it's now the Viper Lounge that Johnny Depp owns. It's this sort of classic music venue. It's legendary in Los Angeles lore. And the archive is full of these photos that just capture Los Angeles. Um, Ed Ruscher would go out every night, every morning. Um, he wanted to get a very specific kind of light. And he also wanted to make sure that there was as few people or cars in the shots as possible. He didn't want to capture Los Angeles as a place full of, of people, but he was really interested in the architecture and the way that the streets looked. And so it's this wonderful cross section of um, of Los Angeles and of the history of the city. Um, you can also end up finding these lovely little tidbits in it. Um, this is how they would keep track of what reel they were on. This is one of the um, assistants taking the photography with a reel number taped to his head. And so we we did the big digitization project and we did the basic create trip life manifest. And so this was the, this is what the archive looks like. If you go through and you do the, take each of the reels, put it into a triple F manifest and look at it in the viewer. So we got to this point and we realized that we, there were a bunch of questions that we needed to ask. Um, and the most important question that we ended up with was when you're on an image, what image comes next? Um, because this is a huge archive and it is this huge collection of images and they're not just random photos. They are, at one level, of this enormous archival collection with hundreds of thousands of negatives for a significant body of work. This is an artist's working document. Um, it was used to make pieces of art. It was used as reference. Capturing it as an archive that captures the reels and the order really reveals Ed Ruscha's working practice. And it's a really amazing way to look at the way a contemporary artist is working. Um, but the collection's also this visual representation of Los Angeles. It's Sunset Boulevard over 50 years, um, overlapping photos. And so it really captures a place. But if you think about it, Ed Ruscha didn't take these photos starting on one side and driving down directly. He would stop, he would go to lunch, he would do all kinds of things. And so the real represents that the act of photography, not the geography of space. And so we ended up with this, do we really want to capture the archival order that preserves that context of the collection as that documentation? Or is it more important as we work through this process to think about that geographical order, um, going with the locations, showing both sides of the street, um, where next and previous aren't the photo in front of it and the photo behind it, but are east and west. Both of these are, are accurate representations of how Ed would think about the archive. One maps well to the books he was creating, one maps well to the objects that were in his archive. Um, and so I think as we talked through these, we realized that the thing that we really needed to do was think through there wasn't a clear answer that we should do one. And there were such interesting things we could do. We said, why don't we try to capture both of those experiences? Um, and I think this is one of the fun parts about digital. If I had to take all of these photos and lay them out on a table, I'd have to choose what the right way to order them would be. Um, they're all virtual, they're all just bits. And so we can order them in any way that we want. And so when we think through these use cases, the research collection viewer was one way we thought that would make sense to look at this archive. It is really focused on the archive as an archive. It's really targeted at a professional academic audience. You know, it uses things like use and access restrictions, um, lots of text. Um, it shows the it's um, it shows the images in that archival context. 
the way that they were taken as a collection. It's also a tool that isn't geared explicitly for Ed Ruscha. This is our archival viewing solution. And so it has to use, be used for other collections as well. And so we can't add too much fancy because we don't actually have a bunch of collections of overlapping photos of city streets. We also have letters and all the usual archival craft. Uh, the other thing is that this is really designed to capture and support information seeking as the behavior. If you've got a question that you want answered, this is really geared towards that use case. It's, you know, we care about the sustainability of this experience. This is a research tool. The URLs that we're putting out, we need to maintain for quite a while. Um, we wanna give people that really consistent user experience that feels like it's part of the Getty, that maps to the way that hopefully our museum collection will look and all the other tools that we're building. Um, so this is a little um, click through demo of what it how this site actually works. Um, it is a, archival viewing thing, you end up with your finding aid, your hierarchy of, of information. Um, <clears throat> it's a very slow scroll. And for each of these components, we have a triple F manifest in it. We've embedded, I think that is the Open Sea Dragon viewer, the standard thumbnails behind. It's a way to sit down and view these components and objects as part of an archival collection. We also said that that's not the only experience that we can power through this sort of um, technology. So we worked with uh, Stamen Design, which is a data visualization and technology company out of San Francisco to pull together what we call 12 sunsets, which uses the same images and the same material and the same triple F APIs behind the scenes to explore that history of LA, to say this isn't just an artist archive, this is this amazing representation of how the city works. Um, we wanted to target it at a broader audience. Um, so it's not, it's designed for people uh, who have memories of LA, who really wanna see this and explore the city. Uh, they may or may not know who Ed Ruscha is at all. And it's really designed to focus on this, to use this collection to its best ability. Um, it's not, you know, this would never work for any other collection, but it is really great and uses everything that we know about this collection to power this experience. And it's really designed for curiosity as the driving feature of how we think people will use it. Um, it's not a great tool for discovering or doing research, but it's a great way to play around with these photos and explore a city. And it's also an access point to the archive. Um, we wanted more people to know this archive existed. We wanted more people to have that experience. And so this gives us a way to go from this experience back to the archival collection. Um, and it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't need to be consistent. It's an experience designed just for this. And so again, the way this works, you have your little truck which is Ed Ruscha's truck. And you drive up and down the city streets, seeing the images there. You can also toggle um, not just this particular up and down, you can also go north and south, I mean, up and down in years and see multiple years of the city at the same time. Um, it's a really, really fun experience for playing with this. And I, I really hope you all take the time to mess around with the technology. Um, and so I wanted to say, you know, behind the scenes in both of these, this, these are IIIF based experiences. They all are using those same, same image APIs behind the scenes. They're all using the same technology behind the scenes. Um, and so I thought, you know, I could do demos of the cool technology, but I thought for this call, what might be interesting is to talk about how that IIIF experience really informed what we were doing. Because I've shown you the two interfaces that we've put out for this. Um, the other thing I will show you is this, which was our first prototype of what we could do. And this was really, this never got really released, but this was the IIIF powered experience where we took the manifest and built an exp a, a interface around that manifest as a way to explore this collection. 
we captured the hierarchy within the presentation API um, and put it out. And what we learned in doing this was really that the AAAF presentation manifest is, a, is not a good replacement for an object data model. It's a wonderful way to capture the organization of images. Um, but we realized is we wanted to provide richer experiences than we could based on the data model at the AAAF presentation model provides. Um, for example, in our archive, one of the things we wanted to do was say, here are, here are images that are near it. Here is the um, camera bearing of those objects, link to thumbnails, provide possible street addresses, and link out to the tax assessor's data for each of those things. This is data that we had as part of the archive. Um, IIIF by design is not designed to be a rich data model that enables this kind of interactivity. That's not its job. It's a really, really amazing way to represent contextual orderings of images. Um, and I think what we learned as we tried to build out that initial prototype viewer was at least for these sorts of archives, man, we should use the manifest and use the presentation API to do what it's good at, which is really those contextual groupings of images. So within the 12 sunsets, one of the things you can do is we've tagged everything with the Google um, Vision API. So you can say, find me everything with pickup trucks in it. It's a computer vision API, so it's, it's not 100% accurate. But this is a contextual grouping of objects in order. Um, this makes a really great manifest in and of itself. It's not the whole experience, but it is a really nice way to say this portion of it, this collection of images in order with all the affordances is the sort of thing that the presentation API is really great at capturing. Or the objects within a particular, or the images within a particular object in the archive is a really great way to use manifests. And so, we learned we really need to manage that kind of where we use them and not try to push too much data into them. We also learned in doing this that IIIF canvases are a really excellent way to collect those meanings, layers of meaning mapped onto XY space. Uh, so we did OCR on all of these images. We pulled out those regions and those blocks. IIIF is fabulous at capturing that sort of We've got an XY space. We end up with these regions that are important for various reasons. We want to capture those. Um, the annotation model embedded within this, the ability to capture those regions, and also to layer different visual presentations on top of each other is an incredibly powerful thing that we're just scratching the surface of how we can use. OCR is a pretty standard use case of it, but as Getty begins to do more multispectral work, as we begin using some of the computer vision tools that are pulling out, um, the best way I can describe it are channels of non-visual information. One of the tools we've played around a little bit with is, um, is saliency mapping. There are computer vision models that will look at a picture and find those highest, the areas in it that are most, um, most relevant and map those to pixels. It's another channel. IIIF does a really great job of supporting that as another layer of annotation that we wanted to capture in this. Um, the other thing we learned is that the IIIF viewers are really good at the jobs that they're really good at. And they're really good at augmenting our interfaces. We put in the in our in our CV, we put in our own you know, open sea dragon and thumbnail interface to see those images. But it turns out that linking to tools like Mirador or Universal Viewer in that interface really helps people do more with the manifests than you could do in our own interface. Um, and it also means we don't have to write it. For the parts of this that need a book viewer, it's really hard to beat Universal Viewer as an interface for viewing books. If you wanna do side-by-side -side comparison of images, uh, Mirador is really good at that piece of functionality. And so, it, and because it's IIIF, Rather than build them, we can just say, go use the tools that are designed for that kind of use case and use those on top of it. And the last thing that we were learning here was that the IIIF image API really lets us use images online um, as images, which, which seems, I mean, obvious, that's what it's designed to do. 
But knowing that we can power an archival viewing experience and this sort of technology, you know, craziness that is the 12 Sunsets application, these are just different ways that we use images. Um, we can also do more things using them as images once they're in this API. And so one of the things that I'm really, really proud of doing is this is our website. I mean, this is the homepage of Getty.edu as of this morning. And on it is one of the images from our 12 sunsets um, or in our Ruche archive. You know, it's the link. But that square image you see there is another IIIF image. It's just another representation of that API. And it's, and it's not just the image behind the scenes, if you know HTML, it's actually an image source set, which means that we have put in using the IIIF API, we capture that the image API. But then we can go and say, we want different resolutions of this image for different um, size devices. If you've got a small device, use a small derivative. If you've got a large device, use a large derivative. And so by having the IIIF image API behind the scenes, we can start building in these accessibility, this responsive design capability really, really easily on top of IIIF. Um, our homepage doesn't use um, manifests at all. It is presentation error image API only, but we can do really clever things by using the power that's built in that triple I have. Um, and because we're using those standards, what we, we found is that it makes building tools that leverage the triple I have API even uh, both easy and reusable across all of our collections. And so one of the tools that we're building as we speak is within our content management application for the website, we're building in a crop tool for our images that lets us say for any given um, presentation of it on the website, import that IIIF um, image API URL and then record the crop coordinates. And so now we can say, we have this image, this is the crop that shows off the part that we want. And then we can use that data that we're storing in our CMS to keep it as a responsive image at different sizes but crop the way we want. We'd love to do things where we use those saliency mappings to help us also automatically find the best crops. So we're building on that IIIF infrastructure that's built into that tool set to give our in-house team more and more capability to use our images. Um, and what we're finding is the challenge that we're struggling with and we're working through right now is really, we are learning and developing more and more information about our images every day. Um, as we start capturing crops, as we start capturing rights information, uh, copyright information, multiple layers of annotation on it, uh, multiple channels of visual data. Um, we, what we're learning is we really need not just an object data model behind it, but an image data model that can start really powering the different sorts of IIIF experiments that we can do as we combine images in new ways, and as we start using these images in more and more places, because the power of IIIF that we're really excited to be using here is by using these standards, we can use the same image and the same APIs to reach many audiences who in many different ways with experiences that are really customized for their needs. So this is the sort of technology that we've been working through. And this is one of the ways that our sort of leaning heavily into IIIF as the way we do images is giving us the capacity to build more and more interesting experiences on top of it and to start thinking about what our audiences want to do with the images, not the backend systems that we need to, to make sure that we can find and distribute those images effectively. Yeah. We know we're always going to need to create sets of images. We know we're always going to want annotations. We know we're going to want derivatives. IIIF means we know how to do all of those things, and it's now a matter of composing them into experiences to help people do the things they want with the content that we're providing. So again, uh, thank you, Meg, and the rest of the team for giving me the opportunity to show off some of the work that we've been doing. I'm really excited to be able to do it at this work, um, and I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you very much. Um, in the chat from Scott, there was a question around our geo-referencing process. Um, 
<clears throat> what we did to for the 12 sunsets to figure it out, um, we're really, we are really lucky that Ed Ruscha was as good at documentation as he was. Those notebooks said, this shoot, we started at this intersection and we ended at this intersection. Um, and so we worked with a company out, um, we worked with the Stanford Geospatial Labs and a company out of Texas called Brain Food. And they built a little app that let us say, the first photo is at this point on a map. The last photo is at this point, interpolate along that map um, using the geospatial data in it. And, um, you know, and then you can go in and tweak and tween between it to coordinate it. So it was a lot of manual work. It was not 100,000 custom positioned images. It was, we're trying to, we, it was that compromise. We talked a little bit about doing some of the computer vision tool, using computer vision to do it. And I think what we learned after some experiments was um, it was going to be harder to train the model to do that effectively than it was going to be to just do a little bit of manual work. And again, we're lucky because we knew exactly where the camera was positioned. We knew what lens it used. Um, and we knew it was driving down the street. So we knew the angle of the image. So we were able to use the really specific affordances of the way the images were captured to help cheat a lot when it came to that geo referencing. Scott, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy to hear it wasn't all manual. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, my colleague Nathaniel's even happier since he would have been the one stuck doing it. Other questions, things I can tell you? I can pop in with a with a second follow up if, if everybody else is getting ready. I, I'm curious, has anybody tried using these sources for any uh, 3D reconstructions yet? Um, we played around very, very briefly, though I wouldn't say definitively. Um, They've got about two thirds overlap on the photos, which is just barely enough to start trying to do some of that structure from motion. Um, it's not great for photogrammetry and they're not perfect stereo pairs. Um, we tried a little bit to say, could we treat them as, you know, in a stereo image pair? Um, it turns out that as much fun as that would be, it doesn't actually work. Uh, but it's one of those things that we really are hoping more people can do research with this collection. We've actually got a, a team of researchers now that we have it available who are exploring what can be done. Excuse me. And they've ended up with some really interesting um, toys. Uh, I think our friends at Yale built a Volkswagen bug detector that scanned all the photos looking for it. Um, the other thing I've seen is someone did take them all and put them into like a, a style game to generate artificial Los Angeles streetscapes, um, which is really cool and deeply horrifying at the same time. Uh, just thousands and thousands of buildings um, that all look sort of distorted, but as part of LA. So I think I would be really excited to see if other, what cool things people could do. I would love to see 3D reconstructions of it. The images are out there. If you know how to get it, use a manifest, you can go out and grab them. And just send me a link or a screenshot if you do something cool. Will do, thank you. Um, Dan, infrastructure. Um, the, uh, we are leveraging CloudFront really aggressively here because there is a, um, <clears throat> yeah, it turns out that if you're going to serve thousands of photos at a time, even our, we've worked really hard on a fast AAA server, um, but we're not that fast. And so we're currently running everything through CloudFront. Um, it is not the most cost-effective solution for doing that scale of caching. Um, and so we're now, but it was the most expedient thing we could do was to cache all of those tiles up there. Um, we're now working with Stefano um, Kosu, our developer has been doing a lot of our AAA backend work to try to figure out a more selective caching infrastructure there. Um, but yeah, the only way to, you know, I, I think half the discussion we had here was how do we empower auto scaling and how do we empower um, caching, knowing that these, you know, research collection viewer works perfectly fine. 
turns out archivists, uh, there are not a lot of people interested in the archive and they're reasonably good at managing and dealing with slow performance. But 12 sunsets really pushed our ability to scale stuff. Um, yeah, thanks, David. I, whenever I see something like that, that works as smoothly as it does, I want to know what kind of dark, dark magic is behind it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, lots of Amazon. Um, Deborah, you were asking about working with educators. It's one of the things. So I will say personally, my biggest learning from working on this project is we did a really good job planning on how to get to the point where the software was out in the world. And we did not do enough thinking about what you do on you know, day two after launch. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing that I'm really excited about is working with some educators at UCLA, um, college level, to use this to tell stories about the music of Sunset Boulevard. Um, and so pulling images from this collection, um, uh, Josh Kuhn, who's a, a professor of Musicology at uh, UCLA is telling stories about the history of LA through its music as a series of blog posts on our website right now. And that's the kind of thing I really like that we can do with this. Um, yeah, I think the next project we do, we need to bring in more of our educational team. I think organizationally, it's a new thinking about that, particularly with the Research Institute, is a new idea. Um, they're not. Getty's not just a museum and our education department really works with that. And so I think as an organization, we're trying to broaden to say all the things we do can both have technology experiences attached to them and also um, other layers of telling stories to different audiences with it. Um, did that answer your question, Deborah? Great, thank you. Uh, Tina, seamless stitching. Um, it is, it is cheating. It is just a um, alpha trans fading alpha transparencies on the edge of the image and guessing what the right value is between them. So uh, it looks reasonably seamless. It works pretty well. It's a complete hack and a cheat. We played around with some of the automatic stitching tools, but it turns out that in a web browser where people can scale their browser up and down, there was no clear way to build that um, a perfect stitching environment. And we also know from watching Ed do it that cars drive through and you really would need to go through and do huge amounts of manual work. Um, he actually did it for a book that was published in the 80s. He took one of these shoots and worked with Photoshop and people for a year to go through and build perfectly seamless transitions of it all. Um, but yeah, we don't, um, I am not an artist and I am not willing to put that level of effort into building perfect experiences. So we found a cheat that was good enough that it works and ran that way. Yeah, no, it's looks great. <laughs> um, one more question related to that. So on the website, the images are appearing in order. So is, is, is the page reading the manifest to determine the order of the images? On 12 sunsets behind the scenes, there's actually a, a GD index that loads up each street. Um, we tried doing it as a manifest, but with the tens of thousands of images in a sequence, it turns out that we needed something even faster to pull them into order. And so um, there is a behind the scenes cache that's keeping all of those things together optimized for serving it up. So okay, Thank whether you. It, it is very possible to have a manifest. Um, I think we've all learned that manifests of 10,000 images or more tend to break software systems. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yep. Um, regarding the OCR, um, again, it was just running it through the Google Cloud Vision APIs. Um, one, of, We use this very much as a prototype internally to talk about um, what we needed to do for both visual, you know, or object recognition tagging and OCR, what would be good enough to do that way? 
Um, we learned that the OCR, particularly the sort of Google Cloud Vision OCR is really, really good. Um, we assume that in many cases we had this like assumption that we were getting buggy data because we get OCR results that we had no idea what was going on until we got the fullerase image and blew it up and realized hiding off in corners are little bits of, you know, words on the side of a of a park bench or, you know, things hiding written on the sides of doors, words that we couldn't see just looking at the image until we zoomed in and played around. So it was really, really good. Um, we learned that the object recognition is um, really weird. It's great if you have modern photographs that are the sort of photographs that you take with a cell phone camera, but um, there was a shocking amount of snow that it found in Los Angeles. Uh, it also seemed to think there were enormous, a lot of tags around classic cars, which makes sense because there's all of these lovely 1960 cars, but they're all contemporary with the photograph. Um, it also told us that, that almost every photo was of a urban streetscape. Um, and there were also enough problematic tags that we had to go through manually and strip out a bunch of those. Um, like, it was not very good at determining gender of people based on these photographs when people appeared. Um, it was bad enough that we just deleted all of those tags from the database. And so we don't actually expose those in our archival viewing environment because they are, they're not good enough to actually be useful. Um, we left them in the 12 sunsets because they are good enough to be fun ways to find images. Um, and so that's, you know, I think we are learning what, what you can do with those sorts of things and also realizing that um, getting results out of a computer vision API for OCR or for tags is really easy. Figuring out what the user affordance is for making those useful and explaining how you got them is the really hard part. So yeah, Tina, the, the visual tags are just coming right out of Google. They are the, the automatically recognized things. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, to play around. Um, I really hope you take the opportunity to look at these two interfaces that we built. Um, if you find anything cool or interesting, please send them my way. Um, I have not looked at everything in this collection. I don't know that anyone has, and we're always discovering new interesting um, photos or weird things or fun stories about Los Angeles through it. So um, yeah, and if anyone has further follow-up questions or wants to, to have a very nerdy conversation about any of the details of this, I'm always happy to talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That was so wonderful. Uh, it was great to see all the really good questions uh, from everyone on the call. So thank you all so much for attending. Um, we are recording the session for today. Um, and so we typically just put these up on YouTube uh, and I can post it in the general Slack channel. Uh, if you'd like to share it with anyone uh, or, you know, watch it again. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And uh, We'll have another community call in two weeks, also on Wednesday, and hope to see you there. All right, bye all, and thanks again, David. Of course, thank you for the invitation. Bye, everyone.